Hey there, folks. Welcome to Sacred Speaks. My name is John Price, and I'm your host. Today is a cool day. I interviewed Dr. Connie Zweig, and I've had her books for many years, including through my dissertation, writing that work, because her, her work really helped me navigate the complexity of shadow, uh, defined loosely as all that uh, those contents that don't fit within the ego ideal. And it's twofold. It's either we don't act out the gold because we believe ourselves to be too small or unworthy, or it's all that nasty stuff that we tend to project out there onto other people, places, or things and blame them for it, scapegoating. It's really complex. It gets really dark very quickly. And uh, dark isn't rich and also dark isn't scary. <laughs> really, really nasty. Um, but Dr. Zweig's work has, uh, has been quite the light in, in that dark, in that darkness. And I'm grateful. Connie, thank you. Um, so the work at hand, let me, let me read her bio uh, before I keep going off on all that. Connie Zweig, PhD, is a retired therapist, co-author of Meeting the Shadow, Romancing the Shadow, Meeting the Shadow of Spirituality, and the novel A Moth to the Flame, The Life of the Sufi Poet Rumi. Her new book, The Inner Work of Age, Shifting from Role to Soul, extends shadow work into late life and teaches aging as a spiritual practice. Connie's been doing contemplative practice for 50 years. She's a wife and a grandmother and was initiated as an elder by Saging International 2017. After investing in all these roles, she's practicing the shift from role to soul. And again, Connie, thank you. Check her out at ConnieZweig.com, C-O-N-N-I-E-Z-W-E-I-G.com. While we're on sites, be sure to look below at the show notes. Check out the links to The Sacred Speaks, thesacredspeaks.com. The sponsor, the Center for the Healing Arts and Sciences, and also Modern Nations, who is, uh, you'll hear at the end of the episode, if you hang around, you'll hear the full song that you heard earlier. All right. Oh, yeah. The the last thing is, if you're listening to this on audio, thanks for being here. And be sure to go over to YouTube and check it out on video. It's a new platform that I'm bringing into the podcast. And I've got a series that's coming out probably in a month. <laughs> for anybody listening, if that seems like a moving timeline, it is. And uh, it keeps getting pushed back a little bit. But we are almost there. And Uh, And I'm pretty sure it's going to come out by mid-October. And that will be on video on YouTube. So thanks for being here. Be sure to like and subscribe to the pages that you find, YouTube, uh, any audio page from iTunes to Spotify to SoundCloud. And like social media. Check it out there. And thank you for all your support. I'm enjoying the comments on YouTube. And um, yeah, we'll leave it there. I had a fantasy about you uh, uh, leading a meditation here at the beginning because I you did such a great job in your book of 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 weaving in some of the more intellectual aspects, but also the experiential aspects at the end of every chapter. There being a a kind of way to engage the material, and and so often so much of this material is either workbooky or intellectual and you brought in both of those and I, I enjoyed that very much. Thank you. Uh, so that breath was a bit of a connecting together. You know, people have asked me for decades now, what's the connection between meditation and shadow work? Because it's not apparent, right, to most people. Yeah. But when we meet the shadow, it's so easily dangerous. It so easily causes anxiety, fear, overwhelm, that we need a way to center ourselves. We need a practice to find refuge inside, to find a silent awareness in a refuge inside the body mind to meet the shadow. So for me, they're natural allies. And that's why shadow work is a spiritual practice for me, because it's really important to do it with a centering practice, whether that's meditation or prayer or breath or mindfulness or TM or whatever the hell it is. Mm -hmm. I don't care what it is. But if it centers you and quiets your mind and calms your body, then it's much easier to work with the internal eruptions of difficult material of negative emotions 
So that's the um, connection there. Well, you're getting and, right off to it. This is yeah. Uh, no, go on. Sorry, keep going. Go ahead. Well, it's. It, I wouldn't say it was surprising, but I really appreciated knowing your background with meditation and spiritual practice, and certainly Buddhism, and um, and a lot of mystical traditions. But primarily, actually engaging in a spiritual practice for as long as you have which which we will definitely get into today and i'm I'll, i'm excited to chat i know you and i've kind of you know a bit of this but as i was sharing earlier i stumbled upon your work probably eight years ago um, when i was doing my dissertation and it was this book that rocked my mind um, for anybody listening or watching meeting the shadow the hidden power of the dark side of human nature it's just a so many authors, so much perspective, and your insight as you presented this information was helped me um, navigate the territory intellectually, but also personally. And so thank you for oh, that. I'm so glad. Yeah. And, and then for us to connect in this way, because your new book on um, uh, kind, of, kind of aging as a spiritual process, what's the official title of the book? The Inner Work of Age, Shifting from Role to Soul. Yeah. And you certainly nailed that. I, I have a lot of people I want to send your book. Uh, and it is, its official release date is coming up in September. September 7th. September 7th, good. So we this episode will probably be out right around that time. So um, for anybody listening, watching, look below. I will create a lot of links for you to be connected with uh, Connie Zweig's work. And uh, Connie, I'm so happy to have you on the show. Thank you. Thank you, John. Yeah. Well, so as, as we've got a little bed there that you laid out about meditation and the kind of um, uh, not only overwhelming images, but overwhelming affect and uh, our physiology, how it, 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 there, there's, not a, there's not a real difference between those two things. There's just a difference of the way we experience them, but they're definitely both present when you're doing any kind of shadow work. And I, I want to start there. Um, cause I actually on this podcast, we've, n I've never had shadow be such a, a prominent, uh, arena to explore as it will be today. And then we'll move into your latest work that I've read. And, uh, I, again, thank you. I feel like I'm cheating cause I got a, an early copy, you know, I, got, I, 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 I'm much appreciating that. Uh, so let's talk about shadow. Let's do all the defining and tending to that, uh, but I also would like to know part of your process of what brought you to uh, put out so many books on shadow. Okay. Um, so in the 1980s, I was working in the publishing industry and I just started reading Jung. And uh, part of it was because I was already meditating and yet I knew I had psychological work to do. And Jung has built some bridges, you know, between um, the psychoanalytic world and the transpersonal world. And so I was kind of immersing myself and then I entered Jungian analysis and began to work on my dreams and began to see that a lot of these shadow figures were appearing in my dreams. And um, I created a series of anthologies the first one was me, and actually the second one. The first one was my first anthology called To Be a Woman. And the second one was Meeting the Shadow. And it struck a chord. And I was really surprised. So was the publisher. So um, when he, when my boss decided to sell the company, I went back to grad school to study depth psychology and explore young, went to Pacifica Graduate Institute. And so that was in the 90s. And um, then I felt more competent to author my own book about the shadow, which became Romancing the Shadow with my colleague, Steve Wolf. And um, as I went into private practice, people the books were the referral system. So people mm -hmm. came to me through the books and my practice really focused on exploring shadow material. So what is the shadow? 
let's kind of be sure that we're all aligned in our understanding of that because <laughs> it's slippery and it's complex and you know so um in the early days of psychology and psychoanalysis freud uh spoke about the unconscious as being full of basically negative evil impulses mm -hmm. um only dark stuff and Jung came along and he said, there's gold in that dark side because anything can be repressed into the shadow, any kind of material at all. So let's say um, as the ego develops, as in childhood, our egos develop because of the traits and feelings and behaviors that are approved of and that are deemed acceptable in our families, in our schools, in our churches, okay? So let's say it's politeness and kindness and taking care of other people. So what goes into the shadow, we could say to oversimplify it, is rudeness, unkindness, uh, self-centeredness. The opposite traits are shamed and they're punished and when we're children and we're seeking love and approval, we learn that those traits and behaviors are not okay. So they get repressed or banished into the personal unconscious. And Jung gave the name shadow to the personal unconscious. Um, in those days, we thought it was just the mind, a part of the mind but we know now that the body mind is functionally identical. So shadow material is lodged in our bodies. It's everywhere. It's not like just some compartment somewhere in the mind that holds all this repressed content. It's a part, uh, it's like a built-in given, woven into who we are. So why would we wanna poke around? Um, I like to say that the shadow is like a dark room in which our dreams and images lie dormant. And shadow work is the process of development in which those dreams and images come back to life. You may have noticed, well, you're a clinician, so you've definitely noticed, um, people struggle with spontaneous eruptions of self-sabotaging feelings or behaviors. So the conscious part of us or the ego is moving in one direction. Um, let's say, I want a relationship with that man. And then a part of us emerges that sabotages that relationship. Mm -hmm. We criticize him or we distance from him or we overwhelm him. And that part of us is what I call a shadow figure or a shadow character. It's a part of that unconscious material that we can learn to become aware of by personifying it. So let's say in this relational example, it's a distancer. So we can begin to notice when we need to distance from this man or woman what am I saying to myself? And the astonishing thing is it's always the same inner dialogue. Whenever it's the distancer emerging, it's saying the same message and the same feelings are coming up with it and the same bodily sensations are coming up with it. It's surprising when you begin to tune in and notice that actually there's a, there's a character there that has these three dimensions, thoughts, feelings, and sensations. Mm -hmm. And when you can catch them, you can give it an image. So let's say the distancer, let's say this is my image for the distancer. It's my palm up, giving the bodily message, stay away, stay back, keep a distance. And then I name it, the distancer. So now some material that was previously unconscious is in my awareness. And it may only last for a few seconds or a few minutes, but next time it comes up, 
And that shadow character goes to sabotage my intimacy by distancing in some way, criticizing or disappearing or being unavailable, then I can go, oh, it's the distancer. And in that <laughs> moment, I have a choice. Do I wanna follow that shadow character and get the result, get the consequence of doing that? Or do I wanna make a different choice? Well, and, the and say to myself, oh, that's the distancer. It's not me. Right. That's right. not me. That's not what I want. <laughs> I actually like this guy. I want to move toward him. But that's the shadow character keeping me from doing that. So the first uh, two questions, pick whatever lane you like. It seems to me that we'd be well served if we explore the idea of identification, identification with a particular belief or pattern or structure. And then maybe related to that is do any stories, I mean, we've both we're clinicians here, and um, are there stories that come to mind so people can start to kind of populate their own minds with uh, examples of, okay. of how this plays out? Okay. So the way we're kind of built is we're unconsciously identified with these shadow characters. We don't know that we are, but we think that's, I think that's who I am. Mm -hmm. I think I'm the distancer. And that's why I can't observe it because I'm lost inside of that habitual behavior. Think about addiction. People have lost their self-observation because the behaviors become compulsive. Mm -hmm. Distancing can become compulsive. Criticism can become compulsive. Um, so along with that shadow character, it has a story not just an image, it actually has a whole story. It has a creation story of when it was born in your psyche. And so I call that tracing the origins of the shadow character. So you go back and you look at, when did I first experience this distancer? Mm -hmm. And what were the reasons for it forming? And what we find Again, this was surprising when I discovered this. What we find is that each shadow character begins as a protector. Yeah. And it only ends up in adulthood as a saboteur. So the distancer began in some way in childhood to protect this person from closeness, from being hurt, from being abandoned, from being beaten, traumatized, whatever it is. And so the person learns to be self-sufficient or closed off or um, unavailable. So it protected him or her in childhood. Now, when that person wants an adult relationship, it's not protecting, it's sabotaging the conscious intention. But if you're unconsciously identified with it, then the whole story of who the distancer is, is who we think we are. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I'm, a, I'm a wounded child. I'm a traumatized child. I can't have a relationship because I'm too scared. That person will do to me what my father did to me. And there's the story. Mm -hmm. And so we become identified with the story. I'm a victim. I'll always be alone. I'm an orphan. I'm an um, abused wife. I'm uh, an abandoned child, whatever the story is that arises along with the shadow character. And I th uh, what I wrote down here is that the one of the issues here, and let's try to expand this a little bit, is that at minimum, or I can think at baseline, what happens is that somebody's f access to a full life is limited. So uh, what what. I think we're saying here is that given this protective mechanism, it kind of divides life into I can only have this rather than have a full expression of what a life could be. Yes. And I would say that happens to everyone. Yes. Yeah. Because we can't live out all possibilities, whether it's the full spectrum of feelings or the full spectrum of behaviors, we can't live it out. So some material is going to go into the shadow all through the lifespan. It's inevitable. Yeah. 
Um, and this kind of returns me to the original comment about meditation. So part of the practice of meditation is to begin to observe how your mind works and be able to watch your thoughts. And when you get there, you can then break the, ide the unconscious identification with the thoughts that you mentioned. So part of shadow work is waking up to the nature of your thoughts and your identification with them and the way in which they control and limit your feelings and behaviors. Mm -hmm. And that's why spiritual practice and shadow work go together again. Well, and, and to, I think Jim Hollis said this once that I really liked it. He said that uh, essentially these complexes are our history present day. They, they, they manifest. And uh, Priscilla Murr was one of my mentors and teachers, and she told a great story about a patient of hers who was sexually abused early on in life, and at about eight or nine years old, started drinking a, a large amount of alcohol. She was into yeah. about a half a bottle of vodka a day or even more. And when I was in my training, it was really shocking because, you know, we have all these kind of moralistic associations with a child drinking alcohol or anybody drinking alcohol in a lot of ways. And, and the way she said this, she said, um, you know, and the alcohol saved her. You know, usually we've we've demonized alcohol and said, you know, it's bad for all these reasons. But, you know, she found something in life that was able to hold her together because she was being so traumatized repeatedly. Of course, when she turned 16, 17, 18, and she was no longer in uh, in danger, she still had the protective habit of drinking the alcohol, which would then kill her. And, and essentially, I like that example because then you're saying to somebody, hey, you got to give up that thing that helped orient yourself, helped, was a companion, was a protector, was a, a valuable behavior, and, and we got to stop doing that because it's killing you. And, and the, there was a clinging to this because in these early developmental years, we adapt, and, and she adapted to that. And that's kind of an extreme example of what happens to everyone. Sure. So the ego develops to compensate for what's lost to the shadow. So if we're not, let's say we're not allowed to get angry in childhood because it's intolerable to our parents. Um, and so we're slammed for that, we're shamed for it, we're punished for it, we're you know, isolated for it, we're abandoned for it we're gonna learn really well not to get angry. Mm -hmm. And then what happens in adolescence and adulthood, authentic anger, righteous anger is not available to us. Yeah. And the same thing can happen with sadness. The same thing can happen with um, our gifts. I mean, this is more what my new book is about our, our gifts, let's say your family values academic performance and they devalue artistic talents. But you're a really gifted artist, naturally, and that all goes into the shadow. And so what often happens at midlife or later in life is people start having daydreams and night dreams about art and becoming an artist. And there's this possibility to actually reclaim some of the positive material that's in the shadow later in life when we're not so busy, you know, empire building, <laughs> right? So it's not, so yes, our full range of possibility is cut off, but it's not only the material that's negative to the ego, it's also you know, our gifts and talents and genius that we may have lost. And it's funny, as you say that, I'm pretty sure when I defined ego in my dissertation, I did so using your words, which, <laughs> which is great. That's really awesome, Connie. Would you define ego for us real quick? I don't know what words I use, John, but I mean, it's the conscious personality that um, 
is permitted in our family loony bins, <laughs> right? It's those, those, and in a way, and in at a deeper level, you know, what the spiritual traditions teach is the ego is a construct mm -hmm. that there's nothing real about it, but it functions. It it helps us to operate in the world. We couldn't live without it, mm -hmm. right? But as somebody said, I forget who it was, you have to become so somebody to become nobody. So we need our egos to operate in society. And at the same time, um, our society has worshiped the ego. The whole heroic model is about the heroic ego. And I would even add ego mind because in our culture, the ego is so identified with the mind. Mm -hmm. and thinking type type in typology thinking types so in you know in our society that is what is praised and respected so what happens if um someone has a different kind of ego development you know what if their ego development is more fractured or more, um, as Hillman used to call it, polytheistic. And there are all these parts that operate differently at different times, rather than this sort of single frame kind of, this is who I am in all contexts. Would you put some skin on that bone? Because that's important. The, and what I, what I think here is that the, the nature of the uh, Kind of Jungian orientation that looks at first half of life and second half of life, and this this may be a solid setup for us later down the road. That that in our first half of life, some of the primary and fundamental values are adaptation, uh, certainly empire building, as you said, or even identity building. You know, like here here's my here's my space. This is my land. This is you know like uh, I I've jokingly said you know there there's a reason why the first two two words after, you know, mama and dada or whatever we say, first two words are mine and no, you know, these are, these are words of differentiation and possession. Right. And, and to be permitted to do that is very important. You know, we need to have a sense of who we are, my body, my space, my room. You know, I bought my son a, a sign once that said, uh, it was a big, like, you know, do not enter authorized personnel only, you know, <laughs> He, he really needed his safe space to be able to, to have that as a little cocoon um, to do his, his personality building work, uh, which is an unconscious process, of course. Um, but, but, but then I think what we're saying here is that given the nature of the time of our birth, our genetics, our environment, our uh, culture, uh, religion, uh, our gender, so on and so forth, that's a certain there's a certain frame in which we fit in order to adapt. And by the nature of that necessary and, uh, and fundamental part of our development, a lot of reality uh, is kicked out or is, is not included. And so then we encounter it in the form of other. That's exactly right. Well said. Good track and so forth. And the other is the meeting with the shadow within us or outside of us. So we could meet the other as a part of ourselves that was buried. Um, someone has never had depression and then suddenly around midlife, they find themselves in a descent. Mm -hmm. So all the material that um, was repressed, was not permitted, was shamed or punished, starts to surface in sorrow, grief, um, feelings that have never, ever been lived out. That's a meeting with an other part of ourselves. We also meet it in a projection onto other people who we other. So all the anti-immigrant sentiment that we see in our culture now is a shadow projection, othering. It's even coming up now. Well, it's coming up everywhere in the political oh. um, climate that we live in, right? It's dizzying. Yeah. So it's a kind of enemy making that the psyche does 
in order to make a boundary like you did on your son's door, to make a boundary between self and other. Mm -hmm. I can't allow that in. I need a boundary. I am not that. I am this. I am this. I am not that. And whatever that this is, I am Christian or I am vegan or I am um, Muslim or I am Californian or whatever it is, right? It again cuts us off from all the other possibilities of being a part of humanity, the one soul of humanity, the one family, the sacred. So to state this very clearly, um, let's let's take a couple of different levels. What you're saying is that the Democrat is othering the Republican and vice versa, and that those principles that are um, hated or despised in the other are part of what is rejected in the self. Yeah. You know... I don't think it's as simple as that. That's the way it's basically understood, right? When we project onto the police, onto the black community, onto um, the right wing, onto the left wing, um, onto rural, urban and rural, onto poor, and what about onto unvaccinated? vaccinated and unvaccinated. Oh, yeah. So we have so many splits in our culture now onto billionaires. So whatever we, the, the basic sort of rule of thumb is when we project onto a person or group without really knowing who they are, that we're attributing something that's unconscious to us, something that we're denying in ourselves onto the others. And there's some great essays about that in Meeting the Shadow. Ooh, um, yeah, there really are. Yeah. So many. So, but because, you know, especially collective shadow projection is so complex, you know, Democrats and Republicans, it's so complex. We could break down the opposite traits that they carry and say, oh, this group carries this and this group carries that and they're you know, attributing that what is rejected in themselves to the others. And that's, and it's true, it has some truth, but it also loses the nuance, I think, um, the complexity of what's going on. And one of the themes in my new book is ageism. There's, you know, we saw with the pandemic, a lot of ageism come up around older people um, who were dying or who were more um, vulnerable to COVID. Um, and lots of ages commentary about, you know, oh, she's 80, let her go. Or um, they're not contributing anymore anyway. Or, you know, they're living in nursing homes, so we're just paying for them. So there was a lot of ages commentary that came up. And one of the reasons I wrote The Inner Work of Age is that I had this experience that absolutely shocked me. I was sitting in my favorite restaurant one day and a, a very, very old woman came and sat next to me and she was really dirty and kind of um, ragged and obviously very poor, maybe homeless. And I said to myself, she shouldn't be here. She doesn't belong here. She can't pay for lunch. And I started to tune in because this is my practice. What am I saying to myself? Where is this coming from, these thoughts and feelings? And I realized that there was an ageist part of me. And it was really shocking because, you know, I've fought against racism and I fought against sexism and homophobia and, and here I was and I was probably about 60 at the time and I was finding this prejudice part of myself that was othering her and attributing to her 
old and poor, what I wasn't able to acknowledge in myself, that I was getting old and I could be poor, who knows, I could become poor. So um, that led me on a whole journey to discover the shadow character that I call the inner ageist. And so I've been teaching now, um, not so much anti-ageism politically in the social and political realm, which other people are finally doing, but anti-ageism with inner work, how to discover this part of ourselves that is rejecting our own age and therefore not feeling self-acceptance, not feeling um, a, really a capacity to um, open to the full promise of this stage of life because we're rejecting ourselves. We're in denial. Well, but aging is scary, Connie. Yes. It, it's like uh, death and uh, uh, decay and uh, uh, yes. aching and I can't move as well as I once did and I can't have sex like I used to. And Yes. These are people's associations to yeah. it. Yeah. So, you know, for me, what that means then is we are not accepting what is. We're not living with what is in reality. We're not experiencing the whole truth of who we are. And we're unconsciously identified with the body's aging, which is not who we are. It's not our spiritual nature. Our age is not our spiritual identity. So if we fall into unconsciously identifying with the inner ageist, we get lots of surgery and use anti-aging products and strive to stay young actively, don't slow down, can't face retirement. Um, and we lose the opportunity to do contemplation and self-reflection in this stage of life. We lose the opportunity to recognize that this is the time for spiritual practice. And if we don't recognize that, if we don't recognize that we're, you know, we have a shortened time horizon because we're like my 89 year old friend who said, I don't want to be with old people. I'm not like them. <laughs> then we lose a lot of potential for this time. I call it the treasures of late life. Then we can't find the treasures. Well, let me pause there for a second, because what comes to mind is the kind of robotics and AI and nanotechnology and essentially this, uh, the line that, that I've heard somewhere is, you know, aging is a disease and we're here to cure it and we're going to use technology to help prolong human life however it can be. I mean, eventually we'll be able to 3D print your own like biomaterial and if you need a heart transplant, you're going to get your own heart. So, so what do you say to that critic? Well, I think that's a really profound question about whether anti-aging tech is um, in denial of the reality or really creating a whole other, now we can live to 100, maybe we can live to 200 stage right. of life. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I don't want to be judgmental about facelifts and I don't want to be judgmental about cryogenics and I don't want to be judgmental about brain, brain transplants. But what I know is this, my conniness will pass. Just as all things pass, my conniness will pass. And whether, and, and as I said in the book, it's not about beliefs. You know, we might believe one thing or another about life after death. I'm not advocating certain beliefs. What I'm advocating is for us to explore 
what's most important to us, what's most meaningful now, hmm. and reevaluate some of the old kind of old ideas and beliefs that we might be carrying around about us, especially the spiritual ones. I mean, I have a chapter about completing spiritual unfinished business. So if we don't, I'll give you an example of a client who was doing Buddhist practices for many years. And as we sort of started digging underneath them, he was still afraid of going to hell from his mm -hmm. childhood Catholicism. So there were just these layers of beliefs there that he was unaware of. And I think for this stage of life, it's important for us to kind of ex excavate that. So I'm not telling you what to believe, but I am saying that, you know, I'm aware that my individuality, my conniness will pass. It may be that um, my breath will join the breath of the universe. My soul may be reincarnated. My consciousness may um, go to another plane. Whatever cognitive beliefs we have about that isn't my point. My point is that now in this stage of life, we actually need to face that fear you spoke about and sit with it for a moment and allow it to speak to us. Maybe that means what do I need to do so that I won't die with regret? Maybe that means who do I need to forgive or receive forgiveness from? Maybe that means um, what creative project is there for me to do that no one else can do? So that's really what I'm asking people to examine. I really appreciate that answer. It, it, it does a great job of not getting caught in one side or the other. Because really what the tension here is oftentimes between a, a kind of idealist or, um, you know, if you're, depending on where you fall with your understanding of consciousness, you know, there's this kind of unus mundus and, you know, unitary reality, or there's a materialist approach that really locks things into a, you know, consciousness is a product of the brain or the mind. And, right. And I, I think by, because regardless of where we're heading with technology, which really does need to be, it, uh, technology uh, needs that kind of attitude that you're advocating for as well, which the purposes of our technologies need to be queried by those who are advancing our technologies. Uh, and just because we can do something doesn't mean we need to or should do something. So, you know, regardless of if we do have a life expectancy in, you know, 30 years of 150 years, we're still going to need to be held accountable to the nature of human development in its form that I don't think anybody would say that it's going to change the, 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 the way in which human beings develop. Uh, so I, I, I just really appreciate it that you, you consistently return to this idea of uh, we need to query our lives, remaining mindful, and also be aware that at some point in our development there was a split. And we can recollect contents of that split and figure out if we're unconsciously playing it out. And if we are, th and this gets back to a question that I had earlier, uh, what, uh, and maybe this is redundant, but what are the consequences of things going into the shadow? Right, that's because that, that's what I think is happening on some level, because most of us aren't aware of whether it's our body, like if my stress response, because we, we say, oh, I'm stressed. I have an ulcer or I have uh, whatever, fill in the blank. And, and I can treat that medically. But if we back up far, we can say, well, I'm, I'm stressed because I'm actually repressing something and the energy's got to be expressed some way. And that's, so what do you see in your experience, in all of your experiences are the consequences of the kinds of shadow uh, dynamics that are created by our development? Um, I'm not sure I can generalize. Um, 
I think it's really, there are so many individual differences about this. So some people somaticize. Mm -hmm. That means that the shadow content goes into their bodies and then their body has symptoms and the symptoms are trying to tell them something. Mm -hmm. um, for some people, it comes up emotionally. Let's say, um, let's say someone is verbally abused in a relationship and is afraid to talk back and is afraid to leave. So there's a kind of paralysis that starts to set in because she or he is repressing a lot of valid feelings and repressing action on her own behalf. So you could say her whole body mind now starts to carry that frozen, um, paralyzed energy. Mm. And individuals will have different responses to that. You know, that could come up later as an illness that could come up um, as the inability to form a healthy relationship later that could come up in her believing that she's a victim and she's helpless, powerless and helpless. And that leads to depression. So it's really, it's really individual. And again, I'm not saying there's any ideal, um, you know, the ego and the shadow develop in tandem and it's just how we're built. Mm -hmm. So it's not like there's an ideal situation where we're not going to form a shadow that's just not going to happen but um when the shadow speaks whether it's in a sarcastic comment that we notice we're making or whether it's in a mood that's kind of intractable or whether it's in a compulsive behavior um, I could use your name and say the sacred is speaking. There's information there. There's intelligence there. It's trying to tell us something. Mm -hmm. It's trying to tell us what we need to do for ourselves, how we need to take care of ourselves. The way you talked about mood there for a second, I think is interesting. Would you say more about that? How moods show this? Yeah. Um, so the last chapter of Romancing the Shadow is about the difference between depression and descent. And for me, um, you know, so much of our country is medicated now. It's tragic to me um, how much power the pharmaceutical companies have. And it's one of the reasons I retired because of what's happened to the field of psychology. Mm -hmm. This is very upsetting to me. So therapists are not being trained to work with depression symbolically and to really mine it for the meaning that's there, for the voice that's bringing a message or voices even, for the um, symbols that are bringing messages, for the um, ongoing kind of um, communication that's happening from the shadow, from the unconscious to the conscious mind. I mean, depression is a communication. And so if therapists are not trained to work with it, then, then clients, and other people are not going to know how to um, travel this journey in this way. They're going to just try to fix the symptoms. And that's really what's happening now. And it's happening in medicine in general. It's happening in psychology and psychiatry. Psychiatrists don't do therapy anymore. And therapists don't do depth psychology anymore. Mm -hmm. So for me, there's a lot of loss. I feel grief about that. You said, you said depression is a communication. Yeah, and, from the depths. And it is. I find myself... Ha having to 
tend to that idea a lot, spending sessions trying to help folks understand what that even means. You know, that, uh, you know, because what I, I think, and you fix this if, if it doesn't work, but I think on some level what the we tend to do in our cultural context is we project a hero image onto the pill, or certainly onto the pharma, pharma complex, we, we, and that's our savior, right? So I, I'm, I'm in need, and I project that, and then I take the pill rather than um, tend to the difficult work of looking inward, despite the fact that we know that every study that comes out on depression, it is, uh, if medicine's going to function, it's medicine in conjunction with uh, a, a, a psychotherapy, except most people don't want to do the psychotherapy. They don't want to do the depth work. So let's move this into my new material. Good. And depression or mood disorders in later life. So it seems to me, and, and you know, this is an epidemic now. There's high rates of suicide, opioid addiction, isolation and loneliness. I mean, our elder population is really having a hard time. Yeah. So, and worse with COVID. So, um, what I've found in working with clients, a few things, and I, I put some of these tools into the new book, The Inner Work of Age. So one thing is, you've noticed that many older people tell a lot of stories about their lives that look like they're reminiscing. They look like they're nostalgic and they're just going back to the past and they're going over and over the same thing. I don't know if you've had that experience, but I have. And what I found is that if we therapists set up the process of life review in a systematic way, so we actually make a timeline of the decades and we help people go through the key moments, the key people, the key events and losses and gains and traumas and victories. And we go through the whole insights. Then we're doing the ego's life review. And that's been known now for about 50 years that this is a need that older people have to digest their history, their personal history, and that many people are depressed because of um, missed steps in their development or regrets about the way things happened or loss of meaning in later life because they can't see patterns. And that when they begin to kind of get some of these things from a life review, that things can change for them. What I added was the life review of the unlived life, because it's not only the conscious lives that we need to review, we need to see what went into the shadow. And so we add that dimension by looking, by connecting the boundary between conscious awareness and unconscious. So how do we do that? If so-and-so was expressed when I was five years old, 10 years old, 15 years old, then what was repressed? So like for me, I loved school from the beginning and I was very encouraged academically. But as a result, I became cut off from my body. I didn't exercise ever. I became cut off from my artistic talent. I became cut off later in life. I became cut off from relational skills because I started meditation at such a young age. I really thought I was going to be a monk. I just didn't want to, I didn't care about anything but becoming enlightened. And so I lost a desire for relationship and family. I didn't have kids. So if we connect what was expressed with what was repressed, we get a whole other level of the life review. And we see the life that's been lived in the unconscious that we didn't even know about. And we have a chance then to begin to 
reclaim some of that material now. And that's one of the promises of this stage of life after retirement. Let me give you some examples. My literary agent, who is a great businesswoman, retired last year and she's painting full time. And she said, I never knew I was an artist. I'm just in joy and spontaneity and play painting every day. Um, I have a friend who was a therapist forever and he's a sculptor now. Um, my husband is playing the bass in a rock band. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we can begin to see, you know, what was sacrificed. And it doesn't mean that, you know, we sh nothing should have been sacrificed. There's no ideal, as I said. It just means that we, one of the benefits of the new longevity, it was that we have the time to pick up some of that now. So that's one of the tools that's in the book for dealing with depression and regret and grief. And um, I've seen some beautiful things come out of that. For myself, I'll tell you, because we're being open here. I've had four different careers. I was a meditation teacher. Then I was a journalist. Then I was in publishing, book publishing. Um, and then I was a psychologist. I always thought they were very distinct. I didn't see, I didn't think about them as being connected. When I did the life review, what I saw was that all of those careers had the same mission, transmitting information about consciousness. And when I saw that, everything made sense. It was as if my life unfolded the way that it had to, because that was my soul's mission all along. And the things that looked like detours or losses kind of fell into place in a different way because I saw that that was the, you know, we could call it the Dharma or the Tao or the whatever we call it that I'd been living all along, the vow. So there are practices for people um, in midlife and beyond that are available, but they're not well known. And there's so little training in therapists world to work with elders, you know, that not too, not too many people really know how to do that. Would you, well, I'll ask it. We'll see where we go. Because what we're saying is that there's a cultural issue Right. Our culture is moving in a direction of reductionism and commodification and materialism. And, uh, you know, we're outsourcing our healing. You know, uh, the reason I asked this is because I started to think about how much you spent a, a bit of time throughout the book, obviously talking about ritual. And this life review was a big one. I, of course, I wanted to explore that, that. The, the value of having these rituals and what happens when we don't have the ritual. So I, I think it's a two-part question. The first is that could you give a couple of examples? Um, one in particular was the great example you gave in the book about the warriors who came back, or they were, it was the Japanese warriors that were on the island and, and kind of reintroducing those folks to the community. And then looking at kind of what we could be more conscious of as a culture to start integrating into our lives so that we can give more opportunity for these uh, dynamics to flow more freely and, and not become so repressed. You know, we don't have rites of passage for older people. We have, you know, the christening and the bar mitzvah and the graduation and the marriage and the divorce. We don't have rites of passage for these very key moments in midlife and beyond. I mean, retirement, you get a watch, you know. Um, so I believe that that's one of the ways we could reintroduce 
the sacred, to use your word, we could reintroduce the spiritual dimension into this stage of life. So how might we do that? Um, yeah, I told the story of the loyal soldiers who um, came back from World War II after being isolated on an island in the Pacific in Japan and didn't know that the war wasn't still going on. And they were ready to go fight again. They'd been there for decades, but they said, take us to the front, we're ready for war. So this is unconscious identification yeah. with that part of themselves that had taken over, right? That part that didn't even function on, when they lived on that island alone. But the minute they returned, they were back in that part and ready to go again. And so the civil society said, you know, we can't bring you back in without first acknowledging and appreciating all that you've done. And so they had a ceremony for that and thanking you and then asking you now to put down the weapons of war. The loyal soldier is not who you are. And enter, you know, civil society again to become a citizen. So I see that as a metaphor for people returning from the workplace, because the workplace in our culture is very warlike. And when people retire and people are identified with their roles at work, you know, I'm a CEO, I'm a salesman, I'm an executive, I'm a secretary, that's who I am. And they're unconsciously identified with these work roles and they have their teams and they have the structure of their day all planned out and it gives them meaning and purpose. And then boom, it's done, over. What happens for people at that moment? There's no rite of passage really to let go of the past, stand in liminal space in the unknown and re-enter with some kind of renewal, renewed purpose and meaning. What could that look like for the millions of people who are baby boomers right now? Who are, I think there's 10,000 people retiring every day right now. Yeah, those are wild statistics. Yeah. Know. So what would a rite of passage look like for us? So for me, I created my own ritual I wrote about it in the book, and it just helped me to feel like I, I left that time behind and I stepped across a threshold into a new stage of life, becoming an elder, you know, and it didn't just happen in that moment. Becoming an elder is a process that requires inner work, but it allowed me to release all those roles and recognize that I'm not that. I am not those roles. I'm a soul. I'm, and whatever our word is for that, higher self or spirit or God, whatever your word is for that doesn't matter. But I am that. I am not those roles. And so that rite of passage really helped me to begin um, this journey of aging as spiritual practice. I like to say age is our curriculum. I love that. How, how can we use all the conditions of aging to evolve, to turn them into spiritual practice, like Ramda said, grist for the mill. How can we use illness in that way and grief mm -hmm. in that way and slowing down in that way to create a natural monastery where we can we can go within and contemplate our lives and harvest the wisdom from our lives and find a, a practice that really fits who we are now because it may not be 
the same religious or spiritual practice that it was during our heroic midlife journey, right? Maybe a different practice. I know, because when you really think about it, I, I think about folks in midlife, even that I work with right now, that, you know, on many levels define their sense of worthiness by their relationships, by their health, by their fitness, by their uh, bonuses, by their routines, and all of a sudden that changes. I, I mean, yeah. yes, the inevitability is for somebody to go into a depression. Yeah. It's a lot of loss. Yeah. It's a lot of disorientation. Yeah. I am what I do. Achievement, success, and I am how I look. So, right? The yes. doer and the image. And again, if we are unconsciously identified with the doer, that's what I call this. One of my clients calls it the driver. Mm -hmm. Another one calls it the provider. Um, so if I'm unconsciously identified with that as who I am, and that suddenly disappears, maybe we're forced into retirement. Maybe we physically can't work anymore. Maybe... Um, the business is sold, whatever happens, when we lose that, we think we've lost ourselves. We think we've lost our meaning. And that's not really where it should have been located all along. So I offer practices to kind of begin to turn your attention from the roles to soul, to a deeper spiritual identity. Lots of practices to begin to do that. And it's very freeing. It's very freeing because we can put down the masks and we have open time and we can listen within more deeply in a way that we never could before. And we can find all sorts of surprises. One woman told me she's mentoring high school girls. She had no idea she wanted to do that and it's just perfect for her. So, you know, there's a, um, if we don't get stuck in the loss, if the loss doesn't become depression, if we have some kind of guidance. And what I, you know, John, what I saw before I wrote the book was that there was very little guidance out there. There are lots and lots of books about aging, but they're not depth psychological. Mm -hmm. They're not about unconscious process. And they're also not spiritual in an ecumenical sense. Maybe there's Buddhism in aging or Christianity in aging. My book is not that. It's kind of um, non-denominational. Definitely. By the way, Buddhism is not my root tradition, by the way. Mm. I'm a Vedanta person since I was 19. Yeah. So there are practices from every tradition in the book. And I just kind of wanted to offer a map so that people could feel more oriented to this time of life. Well, that, then, of course, you and Lionel Corbett had a lot to talk about, if that's the case. <laughs> I know that's the thing also through this book. What's so cool about it is you reference all these interviews that you've had, because as you're talking about anthologies, you know, if I take just this book here, you've got Carl Jung, Robert Bly, Joseph Campbell, Campbell Harville Hendricks, uh, Maggie Scarf, John Bradshaw, James Hillman, so on and so forth. You've, you've connected with, referenced, read, edited a lot of different folks. And so you're drawing from a lot of different wells here, which... Okay. Yeah, so in the new book, it's not their writing. Right. It's not an anthology. It's interviews. And I, you know, I interviewed people I've had friendships with for decades. Mm -hmm. I reached uh, Father Thomas Keating just before he died and Frances Vaughn before she died. I reached Ken Wilber and Krishna Das and Buddhist teacher Anna Douglas and Mirabai Bush and Rabbi Rami Shapiro, all kinds of folks about their own experience of aging. 
and and what kind of practices they're doing now because as i said that changes through the lifespan yes and buddhism i i, I don't i think so often I, I i've studied buddhism for many years but it's such a helpful container for what we were talking about earlier, at least for, from my perspective of giving me a container for meditation and uh, having a practice, having some kind of a, an orientation or a, a path uh, that I didn't get from my upbringing in Christianity. I didn't, I didn't have the same kind of contemplative, uh, you know, my, the Christianity I grew up with very, was very social. It was, it was, you know, that's where we, hung out and met other kids and went to this annoying service in the middle of our whole process that we had to be reverent and listen to my grandmother's sing vibrato. And you know, that was, yeah. it was not, it, and then I found a more contemplative space. I've been able to return to a lot of these traditions with more contemplation. Um, you, you were saying, um, when, as we're talking about aging, and when the job goes or the health goes or whatever happens, it, would it be safe to say that what it does the, the, on, in, in this curriculum that you're talking about, it really exposes one's dependencies and addictions? Is that too harsh or is that language you would use? You know, I think the fear of dependency is a big shadow figure in our culture. So if you think about what we were saying before about the hero's journey and the heroic ego, it's supposed to be independent and self-sufficient, yeah. right? And hardworking and fearless and um, what happens as we age is the opposite of all those. We become more dependent on others. We become slow rather than quick. We become um, less focused on doing. We could say more focused on being. Um, and so dependency, I think, is a big one for men. It comes up for women too, but it's a big one for men. Mm -hmm. Because the idealization of independence, um, we're, we're not supposed to need anybody. We're supposed to be able to do everything for ourselves. From taking care of ourselves, to our tech, to our jobs, to taking care of others, to taking care of the kids, to you know making the money. And so dependency can be filled with fear and shame. Um, I had a positive experience of this with my own father, which really surprised me. But as he moved into his 80s, he got Parkinson's, ended up in a wheelchair, and never complained. But what I noticed, and he, he wasn't a victim, it, that was so amazing to me that he that he was able to do that and his heart opened more. But what I noticed was as I stood and he sat in the wheelchair, this difference in the power dynamic happened because he had always been standing over me. And it shifted the relationship in really interesting ways. And I'm glad that we had him in a place where he got the care he needed and I didn't have to, you know, be a caregiver on a daily basis, but he did need me and he was able to ask and he didn't seem embarrassed by it, which was absolutely, I don't know, it was, it was heartwarming to me. And I felt yeah. such gratitude. I felt such gratitude for what we were able to process about my childhood and how we were able to really um, move him toward life completion. So life completion is another theme in the book. 
That's a fascinating I, phrase. I'd never seen it before. I'd I never haven't really, either. <laughs> yeah. I've never really read about it. But it's kind of natural hmm. for people who are consciously working on their own development in later years and want to face their mortality and want to face their own issues to imagine, you know, what is a completed life? What is a fulfilled life? What does that really look like for me? Because I think it's very individual. Well, what does it and look like for you? For me personally? Yeah. My life has been about spiritual practice at the, at the bottom level, ground level. That's what it's about. Mm. And um, my husband has attained a very high stage of evolution, a very high level of awareness. And so I live with someone who has attained my dream. And at the same time, and so I have to practice, you know, what, uh, that could be what, that's, what that's like for me. Yes. Well, mostly it's gratitude. But, you know, occasionally I feel a little left out. Oh, yeah. But I do have my own experience of high states. And when they come, I'm incredibly grateful, mm. actually, this week I had a big opening. So that's really what it's been about for me. And um, and you know, there's a part of me that says I'll never get to where he is. And I kind of recognize that as a shadow issue because it's kind of competitive and envious and all that stuff. And you know, I am where I am. Right. Right. And I actually feel really good about where I am, my own development. So I think that's what's important. I think the self-acceptance um, and the contribution, the legacy we leave, and um, the people we love and who love us, the creative life. I feel really, really deep gratitude that I was able to write this book and get it out there because this is really the wisdom of my life is in that book and it, it's my gift it's communicated to to at least this person that read it thank you oh yes i when that actually gets to the uh, another question here which is that i i, I mean i want to talk about death and and i i, I so i want to talk about your your not so much what you you processed in the book, but what the process of writing the book was like for you, and certainly drawing from all these interviews, and um, and where it took you, just through your own journey. Um, it was a different experience than writing the other books. This is my sixth book. Um, one of them is a novel, which is the life story of Rumi, um, which was a completely different experience. Connie, you're full of surprises. Oh, you didn't know that? No, this is wonderful. Yeah, a moth to the flame. Oh, it came I love in that my it, it came in my dreams that that book. So this book, um, it kind of came through. What happened was I did a couple of years of research. Um. And I kind of cultivated the habit over many years of um, kind of inundating myself with information and images and other people's points of view, and then meditating and emptying out. And that's what I did mm -hmm. every day for two years. And so when I sat down to write, it just, it just came. First, the outline, came, you know, the table of contents came and then it just kind of filled itself in. Um, and so it wasn't very effortful uh, to write the book. It was harder to sell it 
Mm -hmm. because like we were saying about what's happened to the field of psychology, every publisher said, we want evidence-based psychology. Wow. We don't want to hear about soul. So that was a struggle. Um, and for me, it was a practice. I told one of my friends, I'm practicing rejection, you know, because I am not the book. So I have to practice that discrimination. You know, the book is not being accepted, but I am not the book. And that kind of got me through that period until I found a publisher who's really been terrific. So it's, you know, so writing a book is, takes years. I think it's been five years now. And, um, it's an ongoing practice of walking my talk, you know, really trying to live what I'm advising other people mm. to do. And um, it's very gratifying. Yeah, you're kind of held accountable to the, to the work by you. Yes, that's right. Writing is such, I mean, I don't know. It, you're 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 confronted by, at least I am. I mean, for me, uh, I, writing is a an exercise in dealing with insecurity and anxiety and confusion and judgment. You know, because how do I say this right? And translating images in the mind into words that can best be assimilated by somebody else, because it's you know, simultaneously an expression of something deep from, from within, but also you really need to communicate to the other, you know, uh, with that purpose, I, I think. I mean, I could write a book and just put it in the drawer over there, but then to release a book is to say, no, there's something to be taught here and to be received. And, uh, and, and I, it's encouraging, I guess, to hear from you that it was so effortless, <laughs> just because so often it's, Effortful. A lot of preparation. Yeah, and, I was going to say, you've, you've been in this and, business and for a long time. And <laughs> incubation. You know, long incubation. Yeah. It's not a quick deal. It's a process. You know, the archetype of creativity is preparation, in incubation, inspiration, production. Thank so you, you got to kind of go through the steps. It's not... Um, and I think that's true for everyone. I think that's true for Einstein and Stravinsky. And, you know, it's not, it doesn't take away from genius to say that this is a process. Well, it, it, it's interesting that um, a couple of the examples you gave earlier were about friends of yours who are now sculpting or painting. And they're kind of following their own interior muse, as opposed to living into the expectations of the environment. You, know, you just right. have to go inward and put form to it. That's well, I want right. to I want to be conscientious of our time, and um, uh, considering our, our time here, uh, would, are there any threads hanging out that you'd like to address uh, before we finish up? Um, everyone becomes a senior with a Medicare birthday, right? If you're privileged to live that long, yeah. you become a senior. But not everyone becomes an elder or a sage. That requires inner work to cultivate a particular, the state of mind of the elder. And I would say that it's not so much what we do, it's the state of mind with which we do it that makes us an elder. It's letting go of the ego's agenda and acting on behalf of the common good, on behalf of something greater than our egos. And so I would just suggest that if people are interested in that, if people know older people who are feeling disoriented or lost right now and looking for deeper meaning, um, for therapists who have older clients who are struggling and looking for that, there's guidance here. There's kind of a map to find the treasures of this time of life without dogma, without 
um, too much rigidity because that's not an elder's state of mind, right? An elder is not identified so much with it, with dogma. And so I'm not going to come out there and advocate for, you know, this is when you should retire and how you should and what you should do after you retire. This is not for me to do. So um, there's a kind of freedom that comes with this work. Um, a new sense of authority, a new sense of self-respect, new sense of authenticity, and I would say mostly gratitude. Um, I feel immense gratitude for the way that my life unfolded now. And um, for the privilege of 72 years of life experience. It's really, mm -hmm. it's really been a privilege. What a gift. So it's been a joy to talk with you. I really could feel how you connected to the material mm -hmm. and I can feel your wealth of knowledge behind that, your own, your own knowledge. And so I really have enjoyed the conversation. Connie, thank you. It's, it's really meaningful to connect with you in this way. And I, I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, John. Control.